Hi, I'm Tim Lahatsky. I'm here at the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Standing with me here today is Bob Meknowitz. Bob, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure thing, Tim. All right, so I am a retired Army officer. Uh, I've served in all three components, regular Army, National Guard, and the Reserves. Spent about 14, 15 years on tracks and tanks, and then later on did some work in the intelligence business. Right now, I'm a contractor. I work in Washington, D.C. But today, we're going to talk about why we're here. And first and foremost, today, most folks don't know this, is the, the formation of the Armored Force. It's actually the anniversary, 10 July 1940. So we're here, and our tie-in to this became, begins like this, which is, how did it all start? How did we get there? Well, in the First World War, there was a stalemate along the Western Front. It was trench warfare. The advent of the machine gun made advances very, very difficult and, and very uh, casualty intensive. So the Allies, particularly the British, decided to come up with a way to break the stalemate. What they came up with was an armored vehicle. This one happens to be French, but armored vehicle that either mounted machine guns or uh, cannon. That'll be important later because cannons on what they came to call tanks played a huge role in the Second World War. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So again, how did the tank come about? Well, there were two schools of thought. Something had to support the infantry. And the, it was assumed at the time that the tanks would move at the speed of the infantry, which is very slow. You know, foot soldier stuff. The other school of thought, and this was mainly uh, held by cavalrymen, is that it was an exploitation device that could be used to penetrate enemy lines, wreak havoc in the rear areas, and basically open up the front. Those two schools of thought remain in effect, you know, the infantry side where it's supported, and the cavalry side up through the beginning of the Second World War. And some would say, it still applies even today, many years later. All right, so as we've discussed, the infantry was supported by tanks. Here in this display, you have two infantrymen behind this vehicle, using it for cover and protection as they move forward. You'll see that the vehicle, of course, is fully tracked, and the gun is oriented on the front toward the enemy. It moves at a very slow pace which as we discussed previously, was one of the purposes of armored vehicles. Support the infantry, lay down suppressive fire, let the infantrymen who are behind catch up, enter the trenches, and then move on through their objectives. So Bob, once the infantry and the tanks started to attack the trench line, what would happen next? Okay, well, as it turned out, the tanks were absolutely effective in reducing enemy machine gun nests and getting past the trench line. Uh, it took a while. Again, we mentioned these are fairly slow, very cumbersome, subject to mechanical breakdown because it was in the beginning stages of how to use these pieces of equipment. So when you talk about a different pace, what's the average that, uh, speed that these tanks are going? Well, these particular versions were probably about five miles per hour tops. Three to five is probably average. <laughs> Mechanically speaking, it was built in 1917 or 18. Small engines, anybody who's seen a Ford Model A or Model T, that's the kind of technology we're talking about. So very beginning stages, but yet as, as crude, and I'm, that's my word, as that is, it was still very effective in reducing enemy machine gun emplacements and crossing the trench lines. And in fact, they used to have uh, what they used to call fascines mounted ab above the front so they could drop them in the trenches and kind of roll over things easier. Again, all designed to support the infantry. All with the goal of reducing and eliminating the trench problem, right? Yes, absolutely. So we come to the end of the First World War and the trench as a defensive structure is largely eliminated as a planning tactic. What happens to the tank next? Well, it undergoes a series of iterations. In our country, the tank force was sent, uh, put under the National Defense Act 
to the infantry center at Fort Benning. And that's where the school of thought was. But there was also another school of thought. And it, was, it came from the cavalry because they were used to a very different way of uh, conducting warfare, which is very much faster paced, very much exploitation in nature, and also uh, with the idea that it's an offensive spirit. Those two theories, both the infantry school of support to their, their arm and the cavalry uh, idea of the exploitation, drove tank development and, co and concepts from the end of World War I all the way up through 1940 when the armored force was formed. Back to that 10 July. Back date. to the 10 July. Okay, so as we were speaking with, uh, with you all inside, in front of the tank, it was designed to overcome trench systems just like this one here, and most importantly, the enemy machine gun bunkers on the far side. Once the tank had done that, it was then authorized, allowed, and encouraged to continue moving forward in the more open terrain. Okay, so continu continuing our story about the armor force. So we talked about the smaller infantry support vehicle out of the First World War. We also talked a little bit about tank technology and the schools of thought that brought us up into the 1940s. So we're at 1940. The Germans have had huge success in the Blitzkrieg applying tank doctrine at a mass scale. They've overrun Poland, France, the Low Countries, and the world was watching. That directly influenced American tank thought and development. Our original thoughts were much along the lines of the infantry support vehicle that we saw in the First World War. Later on, both those schools of thought that we talked about previously, both the infantry and the cavalry branches, decided that the army had to mechanize. And by doing that, it needed to be not just one branch, but all branches of the service. That drove tank development and design. So, the earlier tank had a two-man crew. This tank, as an example, has a five-man crew. And we can cover that in, in great detail over the next few moments. So the bottom line, though, is that our tanks, once we entered the World War, had to be transportable and had to be able to fight in all types of terrain, from the Pacific, through the deserts, through northwestern Europe. What we came up with eventually was a vehicle just like this, which was about a mid-range M4A3 Sherman tank. It took us a while to get there. The original medium tank was an M3 Lee with a crew of six. The quotes from the Times say it was like a cathedral going down the road because it was so tall. It also had a gun in a sponson as opposed to a rotating turret like this one. That limited fields of fire and it put them at a distinct disadvantage later on. But what we gleaned from that experiment and that first issue of tank was engine reliability, standardization of equipment, crew training, and tactics. And that was the start of it. Later on, all of that was applied again in Northwestern Europe, first in Italy, and then later in France, Germany. Bob, what's life like being on a tank? <laughs> That's a good question, Tim. So first and foremost, everything is a lot heavier. All your tools are heavier, all your equipment is heavier, and it takes, in current terms, usually a couple hours of maintenance just to ride around in one of these. You're always hot. It's usually very dusty. If it rains, none of the hatches have seals, so you're going to get wet, and it happens no matter where you sit. But there's at least AC in the tank, right? The hatch is open, yes. <laughs> that you know, it, it's like the old automobile joke. We have you know, 260 air, you know, two windows down, 60 miles an hour. Here, you're going about 25 miles an hour tops. Your hatches are open, and if you're lucky, it's a nice day out. It's very, very hot. It's hard to hear, which is why you have intercom systems. This one happens to be one that attaches around my neck so that the uh, other folks inside can hear me. I have a switch here 
that works the intercom or the radio. Because one of the things that made the tanks so effective was the actual communication on the radio systems and the ability to communicate quickly on the battlefield. What else happens when you're on one of these? Well, you are riding around every day. It takes wear and tear. Now there are seats in these, and you know, the, the driver has a seat, the assistant driver has a seat, the gunner, loader, commander, all have seats. So there's five people on this crew. After riding around for a little while though, you find out you gotta stretch. So oftentimes you gotta try and stand up. You know, I always like to stand up in the hatch because for me it was a lot easier. I'm not that tall, but it worked out okay. I can tell you this though, after riding around for hours at a time in this, you need to get out, stretch, stop, and move around a little bit because it affects your ankles. Everything on this though is difficult, but it's also a way to get around the battlefield. I would much prefer, and this is just a personal choice, to ride than to walk. I don't like to carry all my worldly possessions on my back. And that's the be other beautiful part about a tank. You can strap on the sides, and it's designed this way, anything you need on the back of the vehicle. So you've got a camouflage net. Usually you have a tarp that you can rig off the side, and that becomes where you live. If you're lucky, you have a bedroll that hasn't been shot to pieces through, you know, warfare or something else, or ripped off when you go through the trees. It's very important to strap things. Everything has a place on these, everything. Canteens, equipment, ammunition, and it all has to be stowed so it doesn't rattle around as you're going over the terrain. Because that's the other thing that happens. When you're inside this, some people, and it didn't happen to me, but some people get seasick. It, it really affects them that way because they're not up top watching things, they're down inside, especially the gunners, who only have maybe this much to look through. Now in some versions of the Sherman, they used to actually have a periscope and it was a little bit different, but even then you're still looking at this. You said there's a crew of five on this, Bob. What are the five positions on the tank? Okay, well, starting with right here, <clears throat> this is the driver. He's responsible for controlling the vehicle and the primary responsibility for maintenance. It's gotta be like a modern car though, right? With the wheel and the <laughs> gas pedal? No, no, these, remember, these are clutch operated vehicles, transmission, manual transmission, and a set of sticks. If you pull back on one, it slows or stops the track here and it lets you turn. If you pull back on both, it should stop. Let them go forward, you should be able to drive. Not hard. And remember, the folks that, you know, tended to lean toward the armored community were farm boys and had some knowledge of machinery. The theory being people, you know, were familiar with autos and things like that. It's helpful. Everything that you can do mechanically is very helpful toward creating a really good driver. And there's no substitute for experience. You know, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And uh, that takes time as well. But how does the driver see? You know, are they two just ways. standing up outside the hatch or is there a different way? That's a good question. He basically sees two ways. If he's up on a good day, he's up out of the hatch and has his head poked up and can see with complete visibility. If he can't, there's a periscope and that's about this big that you look through and he then has to drive using that. Now, that's also why he gets commands from the commander is to try and keep him on the path. And, and that's a full-time job. Utilizing the throat Utilizing mics. the throat mics and the intercom system. That's inherent with all the vehicles. So, so we've got a driver. What about the guy next to him? The guy next to him, originally called an assistant driver. Also the bow gunner. Now, his primary responsibility is operate the machine gun right in front of him to keep enemy forces away from the vehicle. But his secondary duty is also to have the, help the driver pull maintenance, because this is a system of systems. Engine, communications, tracks, you name it. Turret, and a ton of things that go with that, including the gun maintenance. All of it's designed to keep the vehicle functioning, and the driver needs as much help as he can get. In fact, the whole crew usually pitches in. That's, that's how this goes.
So then we've got our driver, assistant driver. What about the gun? Is How many people are on that crew? Okay, so up in the turret on this particular vehicle, there are three people. One of them is the gunner. His job is to put the gun on target and squeeze the trigger. That's what he does primarily. That is his focus. He's also responsible for maintaining the gun system itself, take apart the breech, and, and do all the maintenance that is required in the turret. And he's the primary guy to do that. The tank commander, of course, assists him, but oftentimes the tank commander is doing other things, getting orders, gathering maps, making sure there's fuel, water, all those things. The gunner, though, primarily, and this is where battle drills and training comes in, like I said, has the responsibility for laying the gun on the target and engaging. In these days, with these tanks, it was not uncommon to have a couple rounds that he had to fire to get on target. It's called burst on target. It's a good skill to have, and good gunners could do it really quickly. To make the gun work, though, you also need a guy on this side and that's the loader. All he does, all he does primarily is load the rounds into the gun tube. Make sure it's safe, get out of the way, and that lets the gunner do his job. The loader is responsible for stowage of all the ammunition, making sure all the weapons are actually clean and everything else, and also assisting the driver with all the maintenance. Everything comes back to maintenance. And that's how this, you know, this works. The loader is oftentimes a real busy guy. So now if you put the four of those guys together, they have to be directed somehow. That direction comes from the tank commander, who's responsible for the employment of the vehicle and all that occurs. And he also is up top. He gives direction, makes reports, and goes from there. We're standing in front of the M4A3 Sherman here at AHEC. Bob, can you tell me what a little bit about this tank and what each part does? Oh, sure, absolutely, Tim. So, starting at the top, all right, you have your turret. We already talked about a three-man crew and what those people in those positions do. 75 millimeter gun firing a variety of rounds. What do you mean by variety? Well. It could fire high explosive rounds, it could fire anti-tank rounds, it could fire smoke. This particular weapon was particularly useful in that regard. Later versions of the Sherman, with longer guns, really only focused on the armor-piercing side. Tank platoons, which consisted of five vehicles, usually tried to have a mix of these and the longer-barreled guns. Uh, for a variety of purposes so that they were ready to handle any situation that came up. So we've got a turret, you've got your main gun 75 millimeter, you've got a coaxial machine gun which is a 30 caliber M1919. There are several of those on this vehicle. There's one in the turret that's called the coax because it operates with the main gun and then there's the bow gun which we talked about a little bit when we talked about the assistant driver that's supposed to have, cover the front and to keep uh, personnel away. So then we have the hull. This particular version happens to be a flat-sided, small hatch system. What that really translates to, it's about the middle of the production run. One of the beauties of this vehicle, the Sherman in particular, but all most, most US vehicles, was standardization. You could interchange parts. That becomes very important when you're supposed to supply an army on the move, which is ultimately what this had to do. So this one happens to have a square hull. It also has a pleak armor on the side because they found by this time that some areas of the Sherman were vulnerable to anti-tank fire. Uh, the opposition being, you know, German optics, German weapons were very, very advanced, and they could actually uh, destroy one of these vehicles. It wasn't easy, but if you hit a tank in the right spot with anything, it, it could go up in, in flames. What you also have for mobility are the tracks. Now these happen to be rubber. 
So it's pretty well suited for going through towns, roads, things like that, you know, and not tearing up things. There were also versions of track that were solid metal. A lot more mobility, but, but they tear up stuff. <coughs> These actually uh, are pretty easy to maintain because you can replace the pads. Other than that, it has a later suspension here, but not the most developed. That came much later. This is kind of, like I said, the mid-range. And it's all designed to make the ride very comfortable. Whether it did that or not is a matter of conjecture, but they were trying, and, and that's what you would expect. So what's this, how's this thing move, and what's it powered by? Well, the Army did a study, and they lined up 40 tanks, and they put every type of tank engine and every power pack and everything that went in, and they tested them over time. And what they found is that the particular engine that this one has, which is a Ford engine, came out the best. Reliability, you know, less miles before replacement, overall maintenance, and so they decided to equip the vehicles with those. This particular version happens to have one of them. So what else does it have? Uh, there was a smoke gun up top in the turret, which provided a little bit of protection if you had to back away from things. That changed later on. But basically everything on this vehicle was designed to employ it, keep the crew reasonably safe, and to maintain. How were these used in combat? Okay, it's a good question, Tim. A variety of ways. Uh, first and foremost, they were used to support the infantry, just like they were designed to back in the First World War. But they were also used as an exploitation vehicle. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a platoon, a tank platoon, consisted of five vehicles. They operated in sections as well, which is either two vehicles or three, but never alone. Tank teams or tank companies were always used in conjunction with armored infantry or regular infantry as a combined arm mix. They also used artillery, self-propelled artillery to keep up with the tanks. In the best case, tanks were used as a breakthrough force you know get through the defense and then an exploitation force to go into the rear of the enemy take out their logistics their supply so they were never really designed ours weren't at any rate to fight other tanks they were designed to fight all the other vehicles which in this case the sherman did really well because of the variety of rounds that the gun used and some other things so back in the museum, we talked about the tanks being designed for infantry. Could these operate by themselves without the infantry? Well, great question. They shouldn't. In all times, tanks and infantry have to work together. That's when things work best. Because of the battlefield, there's mines, obstacles, towns. Tanks shouldn't fight in towns alone. But the infantry they're uniquely designed to not only do those items, but also help move the tanks along. It's a symbiotic relationship. Both the infantry are relying upon the tanks for support, and the tanks are relying upon the infantry for protection. And it's the close-in protection, because as you look at the side, this is a flat side vehicle. Both anti-tank rounds or anti, you know, Panzerfaust, anti-tank rounds held by the infantry can get close to the sides because visibility is not that great along the sides and to the rear. You have to be very, very cautious, but that's why our own infantry was designed to work with our tanks to cover them, and, and in turn, our tanks would be able to cover them. But they have to work together. It's a true combined arms uh, process. It's also the way things work best. We talked earlier about German anti-tank weapons or what types of weapons are effective against the Sherman tank. This happens to be the biggest of the bunch. This is a German 88. This one happens to be an anti-tank roll, towed so it could hide amongst the tree lines. Absolutely effective almost at any range. Um, 
absolutely the threat to the Sherman, in addition, of course, to mines and other things that they would come across. The Germans were masters at anti-tank warfare. This is the very pinnacle of that effort. All right, well, Tim, my understanding is that you are absolutely much better at this type of vehicle than I am. So for a change, I'm gonna ask you a question or two about this vehicle behind us, and more importantly, Tank Destroyer Doctrine. All right, Bob. So the first question, of course, is what drove Tank Destroyer Doctrine early in the war for the US? So like you talked about over by the Sherman, the Sherman was developed partially in response to the German doctrine of penetrating, exploiting, and destroying the French army in 1940. While the U.S. Army copied that for their offensive capabilities in the form of the tank, they actually also had to answer the question of how do you respond to that offensive strategy? And lo and behold, the tank destroyer. So originally, the French had built fixed and placed guns in the form of a towed anti-tank gun. It, it looks similar to a cannon um, that you would associate with the artillery in World War II. However, what they found is, is those guns were not able to easily respond to the penetration achieved by armor and the tank force. So what they had to do is combine the speed of the tank with its armament while allowing it to reposition to meet the offensive demands as dictated by the attacking army. So, one of the forces that were created around the time that the tank branch was created was the tank destroyer force. And originally based out of Camp Hood at the time down in Texas, its goal was to help develop both doctrine and equipment and tactics and techniques for responding to German offensive engagements. Originally, the Army provided them with the towed guns, approximately a 37 millimeter, which then scaled up to a 57 and then to a 17 pounder that they copied from the British. So it wasn't mechanized initially? No, it was a towed piece that would come behind either a three quarter ton, a ton and a half or a deuce and a half truck. Didn't, didn't they mount 37 millimeter guns on Dodge trucks for a short time? They tried it, but what they actually found is, is it didn't have enough armament. All they did was they took the cannon, they put it there with a small, approximately three inch piece of steel, and it did not have enough protection around the 360 to provide protection against aircraft, artillery, and small arms fire. Interesting. And that led to mounting guns on half tracks, didn't it? Yes, stopgap measure actually. What they were pulling was, was old 1897 75 millimeter howitzers, and it had a very limited traverse. It could only go a few degrees off the front of the tank, or excuse me, the half track, in order to provide fire. You could only fire forward. Okay, so what so that it was, was just was, a, a very narrow arc then. Exactly. The goal was to be able to create a platform that could fire on a 360 degree traverse, as opposed to just a very narrow thing. All stopgap measures, and they did exactly what they were supposed to do. Introduce the tactic, introduce the technique, and test the technology then for further development. Which gets us to what we have behind here. Sure. This is an M18 self-propelled gun, more commonly known as a Hellcat, was designed approximately in 1943 and fielded around the same time and saw service through 1945 and sometime even in the Korean War in a limited role. So what differs from the original and early type tank destroyers is it's actually built similarly to a tank, mm -hmm. but it's more lightly armored than the Sherman or other tanks comparable to it. It has a bigger gun. It's got a three inch, which we equivalent with a 76 millimeter gun with a uh, better performing round than the 75 millimeter Sherman at the time. And even then with the 76 guns on the Sherman mm -hmm. solely because of the ammunition differences. Okay. It's not firing your HE as much, your high explosive round. Um, it's more designed to provide support and uh, to the infantry as they try and stem the tank advance of a German uh, offensive uh, maneuver. However, not always what it was used for. So what are some of the other uses that they uh, they use this vehicle for? Well, like the tank, it actually got thrust really into an infantry support role. Because German armor originally, early on in the war, was conducting limited offenses, mm -hmm. it was then put into those positions. For example, at Iron Corps in September of 44, the 704th Tank Destroyer Battalion, which this tank destroyer is marked for, mm -hmm. actually maneuvered into positions as the German offensive drove towards infantry divisions and then fired flank shots. Approximately, excuse me, 
Um, 40 of these were in position various places across the battlefield and held off almost an entire German armor division at the time, buying time for the Americans to reposition and then counterattack and basically blunt the German offensive. Wow, that's a great example of how these should be used. Mm -hmm. How else were they used? Well, again, designed for speed and maneuverability, the goal was to provide, get into a position where it could then fire on the flanks and hit German armor where it was weakest. It wasn't designed to go toe to toe and, you know, have a duel with the German armor. It was designed to go into a position, get behind on the flanks, the rear, and move into position. It's also designed for survivability. So we talked about those fixed positions that the French had in 1940 with their um, fixed anti-tank guns. These are designed to fire and then relocate to a new position on the battlefield. A clear example of that actually comes in December of 1944 at a little town known as Noville on the outskirts of Bastogne. The 609th Tank Destroyer Battalion attached to the 10th Armored had a tank, platoon, tank destroyer platoon there of five Hellcats. And those five Hellcats held off an entire German armored group at the time, basically buying time for the infantry to come in and support the offensive that was moving through there. By displacing from each location, the Germans thought that there was an entire armored division there, not just five tank destroyers. Wow. How did this tank fare against the Mark IV, the Mark V, and then the Mark VI versions well, of the German tanks? Remember, the Mark IV we could argue is comparable to our M4 Sherman we saw over there earlier. Right. However, as we get towards the later tanks, it becomes that question of where is the armor weakest? So for the 76 gun, because it's using a special high velocity armor piercing round, HVAP, yep. It's an upgraded round compared to your normal 75 or 76, sure. which has a much slower muzzle velocity. And there's two ways you can increase your force on an object, your mass or your acceleration. At a certain point, those barrels aren't going to push much more mass. Yeah. But if you overpower it with the additional accelerant, sure. the round goes a lot faster and will penetrate better. So with the Mark IVs, no issues. About comparable to the Sherman, it was engaging them at a thousand yards, no issues. But as you see with the Panther IV, or excuse me, the Panther and the Tiger, the Mark V and Mark VI respectively, mm -hmm. becomes a lot more of a cat and mouse game. Find the flank, the rear, and engage from sure. there. Sure. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, Tim, so we talked about crew positions on the Sherman tank. I'd love for you to tell us about the differences or the similarities in the crew positions for this particular vehicle. Well, like you said over on the Sherman, it's a crew of five and it's very similar. However, it's got a lot of differences because of the role it was designed for. So in our front left, like on the Sherman, we have our driver moving it with sticks and levers and a manual transmission, clutching every time you want to change gears, moving forward, backwards to turn. And then on the right, though, is where we start to differ. Instead of a bow gun on the front, because again, these were designed to support the infantry right. in a defensive position, it was not designed to engage the infantry. Right. We don't have a bow gunner slash assistant driver. We right. just have an assistant driver and radio operator. Oh, okay. While the Sherman had the radios on the back of the hull for the tank commander to operate, we have a guy assigned down here to operate the radios for the crew. Okay. However, again, the centerpiece is the main gun, right? So we've got our loader on the left side and then our gunner and tank commander on the right. Mm -hmm. However, we don't have a bow gun, or excuse me, a coaxial machine, machine gun with the main gun. Right. We do have an anti-aircraft 50 caliber machine gun oh, that sure. was then employed for use against anti-material, lighter skinned vehicles, infantry, um, or some positions depending on that. Wasn't that the standard weapon on top of most armored vehicles? It was, because doctrine prior to the war was a 50 caliber machine gun is enough to repel attacking airplanes moving at World War I speeds. <laughs> right. But with the modern aircraft, we know that right. doesn't really work other than to scare people off. Sure. Excellent. Well, please tell me more about the guys in the turret. Sure. So like we said, we've got the crew up there. The tank commander is the one coordinating and orchestrating all the positions. He's telling the driver move up to engage, usually from behind a position. Then they'll emerge, fire, and then he'll give the driver commands to relocate. Still driving with the periscope in combat conditions. Mm -hmm. However, they can drive open hatch as well. The gunner is being told aim at which target, you know, left, right, center, on target, and then when to fire. And the loader is loading the round type that they want sure. as di dictated by the tank commander. So for the tank commanders, you would then have your four tanks. Then the fifth tank would be your 
uh, platoon leader who would then dictate how all of that worked. Okay, Tim, so you were talking about the tank commander. Isn't that the same guy? He's going to be able to fight his vehicle and then also coordinate with the other vehicles to his right and left sometimes? Exactly, Bob. The tank commander's got one of the arguably one of the hardest roles in terms of being on the crew. Mm -hmm. While the driver just has to focus on driving and the gunner just has to focus on shooting, the tank commander has to orchestrate the driver and the gunner, moving them into position as they're required so that they can then achieve the mission. So the gunner's not firing before the tanks had stopped mm -hmm. and the driver's not moving when the tank's firing. But on top of that, there has to be somebody to coordinate between all of them. So what you would do is you'd have four tanks in each tank destroyer platoon. One would be the platoon leader or platoon commander at the time, who would be in charge of all four of the tanks. And then you'd have your platoon sergeant. And then two sergeants would be in charge of the other two, what we'll call the wingman tank destroyers. Sure. The platoon sergeant's responsibility is to help orchestrate the personnel, while the platoon commander's job is to help plan and organize the on-ground fighting while reporting back to the company commander and telling him what's going on, with the company commander then providing direction and guidance for his platoons to fight. So, it's, so in my uh, understanding then, it's all designed to put this weapon system in exactly the right place at the right time to engage the enemy. Exactly, and it's all about stopping the German offensive movement. And as we talked about earlier, at places like Arancor, Bastogne, and during some counterattacks where they were actually using them in limited offensive engagement in terms of moving them into position to help support either in a direct fire, like we talked about against mm -hmm. other tanks, but they'd be using it against bunkers, or they could put them on the backside of a slope and fire them like artillery in an indirect fire role. A really versatile vehicle, however, unlike your Sherman, it just does not have the survivability. It takes one hit and it's bedtime for Bonzo. So then let's talk about mobility. Survivability understood completely. So we've got steel track. Mm -hmm. Why don't you walk us through kind of the perks of this particular vehicle as far as mobility? Exactly. So if we come over here and we look at our suspension, this suspension is actually more closely related to a Christie suspension system mm -hmm. that was used on tanks like the T-34. What does that give you as compared to the Sherman's suspension system? Gives you speed. Sure. The other tank destroyers used during the war, the self-propelled guns, the M10 and the M36, were based on the M4 Sherman chassis, and they were slow. They had the firepower, a bigger gun, and they were able to engage, and they were lighter weight, so it gave them a little more speed than your Sherman. But because of this upgraded suspension system, tanks like, or excuse me, the M18 Hellcat could get up to 65 miles per hour, faster than the modern M1 Abrams with a jet engine. Absolutely. Talking about the engine. Walk me through what was the top speed, you know, anything that made this easy to use and maintain. So just like the Sherman originally started, it started with an R975 Continental engine. It's actually an airplane engine. While the Sherman, because of the numbers produced, had to go away from that because, again, you can either make an aircraft engine or a tank engine. You can't have the same engine being filled in both roles. The tank destroyer branch actually did not learn the lesson that the armored force did in terms of being able to get an independent engine for their tank. So this one actually uses the same early engine as the Sherman, the Continental 975. It's a V12 radial engine and it goes around and it provides almost the same horsepower as the Sherman, but the difference is the weight difference. This combined with it being produced in less numbers than the Sherman, approximately 8,000 were produced, it means that there's not as high demand for the engine type. It means that the tank destroyer branch was actually able to use this effectively in its position. Maintenance on it, however, is a different story. The airplane engine, because it's round and you can access the whole thing, is easy to fix and maintain. But with tanks and tank destroyers, you have to remove the engine to get to the bottom spark plugs on it, which makes it real difficult when engines like the 975 that are constantly fouling and needing spark plugs cleaned, and you got to do maintenance on it. Well, thanks for joining us today, Bob. We appreciate your expertise on the tanks and listening to me talk about the tank destroyer. Oh, uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. I just appreciate being out here, be able to educate folks just a little bit. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Before we let you go, we're going to do a quick overview on all the remaining tanks that are here for your viewing at the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center. This is the M60 main battle tank developed out of the M48 Patton tank. This tank was actually used uh, against in the Cold War, patrolling the border between East and West. This is an M46 Patton tank 
used during the Korean War. This one is marked up in tiger camouflage, used to intimidate the North Korean and Chinese soldiers. This is the M42 Duster self-propelled anti-aircraft gun. This self-propelled vehicle was designed to provide anti-air support for armored columns and other soldiers. This is the M2 Bradley infantry fighting vehicle with a crew of three and carrying six dismounts for infantry. This vehicle was designed to provide mobile fire support for dismounts and to support the tanks in an armored column. Carrying a 25 millimeter Bushmaster, this vehicle has served in a multitude of roles ranging from Desert Storm all the way up through modern operations in Iraq and Syria.